everyone, to another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. Uh, we've actually been off for almost five full days, Marcus. We pushed the show on Friday because I was ill-prepared. We were off Saturday. Uh, Sunday, I fell asleep. I don't know how that fucking happened. And then yesterday, Swisher texted me. He's like, I'm already in bed. But yet he was watching Raw. <laughs> Uh, so we're back into the swing of things. We got four shows. It's like, God damn, we have not done this in four days, Marcus. What the hell? Since Thursday. But we have four shows ready for you tonight. Making an impact tomorrow. Thursday, uh, Marcus, Castlevania Season 3, already watched it. Thoughts on Thursday? Woohoo! Oh, nice. Yeah, yes. Uh, have, you, have you partook in the Castlevania yet? I think I tried to get through some of season one. For some reason, it's just not its not clicked with me for whatever reason. Like, I know it's a great show. It's just not clicking with me. Maybe I just got to sit back and, and really uh, sit down and go back through it. But I've heard nothing but great stuff. And I'm glad because between that, Voltron, hopefully that's um, leading some other great stuff coming down the line. As we know, I think we're getting two different He-Man series. So, I'm, you know, hopefully it's in that vein of uh, goodness. Yeah, season one, for a lot of people, it didn't land with them. Uh, for me, I liked season one. My gripe was season one was way too short. But they went from four episodes to eight episodes. This season, they have ten episodes. Um, and, and for me, the ten episodes were great. Uh, but season three is is not the most beloved thing in the history of the Internet. It's It's not bad, but there's a lot of, in people's opinions, there's a lot more that they could have done. In, in this series and honestly I think my biggest gripe with season 3 is and this is like a pro wrestling issue too at the heart of it a lot of it was telegraphed like you knew what was coming like you didn't know but you knew like okay we're going to McDonald's but like okay we went left when I thought we were going to go right but we still got to the same place now that might upset some people. That might not. For me, I love the story. I love the voice acting. The animation's stellar. The fight scenes are great. The uh, the characters got like the main characters are fantastic, uh, and and the pairings are, are great. But this season, I think you know this is a show about death and Dracula and blood and gore, and I think this season got even darker somehow. <laughs> So yeah, uh, it's 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 gonna be something we'll talk about on Thursday. But tonight we're talking the pro wrestling. That's E Drick. By the way, Thursday show Twitch.tv backslash Comic and Game Court. Check it out. Um, tonight's show is obviously brought to you by Twitch.tv backslash Wrestling Underground and RealNerdCorp.com. By the way, I'm Chad Porto. He's Marcus Green. I didn't do the intro, and now we're off and running. Marcus, Circle Square. We got to see some Kobe Carino and George yeah. South. Yeah, we got to see a new Jack and a real time throwback. Um, yeah, that was a that was an interesting pairing. And consider, I mean, that they, they told a little backstory about uh, apparently uh, he's been kind of a mentor to, to Carino, who who uh, admitted when they do a little uh, the sit down interviews that um, you know he was up and coming when he was nineteen and he fell to like I think a heroin overdose or something. Some type of overdose, and he had to bounce back from that. And then, you know, South has been a, a, kind of like a father figure in a lot of regards in terms of motivating him, helping him get to where, you know, he is now. And uh, I think it even got mentioned that he might have held him when he was a kid. So, talk about coming full circle. So, uh, some, some good stuff from both of those guys. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm laughing, but I do. There's an episode of American Dad where Steve befriends, actually it's Roger dressed up as Steve, befriends the uh, daughter of a senator who's like a giant heroin head. Like she, she's just all coked up all the time. And they're having dinner and the daughter o- ODs and the father doesn't give a damn. And the, the, na- the maid or the nanny runs in. She's like, I'm not going to let you die. And she stabs her with like, like one of those uh, adren- uh, adrenaline needles. And she comes back and she's like, I bathed you in the bathtub or whatever. And she starts freaking out. It, I don't know why I, I, I immediately went to American Dad when, when you're talking about it, but I don't know. I'm broken. <laughs> uh, how did Co- Kobe look? Because he was in the Ring of Honor for a little bit with his dad. And obviously when his dad went to WWE, um, 
Ring of Honor wasn't really that wanting to bring in uh, bring back Kobe. Uh, so Kobe ended up hitting the scene. I don't know if Kobe left on his own. Like I, I should I should be clear, uh, careful about that. But Kobe, one reason or another, isn't with Ring of Honor anymore. It seems like he's gained some weight. Uh, he, he looks to be about 25, yeah. 30 pounds heavier than he was in uh, Ring of Honor, which is good. He, he looks very – he no longer looks spindly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't need to pretend yeah. that, you know, he looks good and say, he, oh, he, he looks very wiry. <laughs> no, he just looks tiny as fuck. Yeah, yeah, he looks he looks good. Like I said, um, I don't remember a lot during that time of Ring of Honor because there's just so much that's happened, but – he does look better. Does look, you know, healthier both physically and uh, from what it, from, you know, from stuff he said, you know, mentally as well. So uh, that was cool to see that it looks a lot like his dad, of course. Um, and then you know, talking about the, the third generation of Carino, talking about his son. I think he had his son's name on uh, his his uh, wrist tape or whatever. So yeah, it, it was cool. It was it was good to see him uh, kind of infused there. Maybe he could do. But in NWA and stand out more there than he ever could have in Ring of Honor, specifically his first thing. But definitely now that they're trying to switch stuff up to get some momentum back on their wings. So I think this could be a good uh, place for the kid to kind of grow. I, I'm right there with you. Then we got Dana Kendrick over here. Um, who Who's this little tiny short person, Marcus? Do, do we get a name? It's, I, think it, I think it says Danny Jordan. Yeah, yeah. I, she was uh, some some type of ultimate mean girl. She had a burn book. Obviously, I didn't connect with any of it. <laughs> um, what? Except on the height, but definitely. <laughs> I think we actually got a few inches on her. Marcus, you didn't watch Mean Girls when you were growing up? How dare you? <laughs> uh, I could just see Marcus now. Yeah, because I want to watch a movie about four white chicks having issues. I mean, fair. <laughs> um, so Danny Jordan is a uh, straight-up ringer for Anna Kendrick, minus the tattoos. So, mm. I mean, cool for her, I yeah. guess. Yeah, and her opponent kind of reminded me a little bit uh, of Piper Niven. Yeah, yeah. Um, bit thinner, not, I don't, maybe a little bit taller. Uh, definitely has the same type of um, gear. With that, is that like? I don't know if she has it. Some tassels. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Uh, what I've seen uh, with this kind of gear, it's it's kind of like um, like a bathing suit, like a one piece bathing suit. Sometimes they'll put frills on the back half of their thighs and around their butt for some reason. I'm just like, why? Yeah. <laughs> is it it's for funny. aerodynamics? I was, I, it was it was funny because I was watching an interview uh, earlier today with Laz Alonzo, aka Mother's Milk, on the boys. And now that we're talking about the tassel on the arm, she's got me thinking about um, freaking Homelander's outfit <laughs> with the stuff on the side. Yep. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's it's like that military kind of cadet uniform tassel. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, gathering. So how was how, how are the matches? Because obviously, uh, or maybe not so obviously, I didn't view this week's Circled Square because yeah. I, I was I was saving the world from pinking the brand. So you're welcome, world. A broadcast partner is a very busy man. Very. Busy. Uh, it's not right. Marcus, if I'm not right, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Except store run. He also does a lot of store runs um, and, and stuff of that nature. I do, but, but uh, I'm writing while I'm doing it. It's extremely hazardous, sh- and I've caused so many accidents. Get her into the Chipotle. Keeps typing, drive with my knees. So what do you uh, think of these two young women? Two young women that were cool. I liked um, the, the young lady... Uh, no, no, I forgot her name, which is a sticking point because she never really said it when she was up there. Um, Danny Jordan. But uh, Danny's opponent. No, the other young okay. lady. Um, uh, she never really said her name when she was up there, but they obviously they put it up on screen. But that was a point uh, in the promo. Their match, well, it's, I guess we start on the promo. I liked... Back 
back up and 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 closed out good. The other girl, she had a lot more confidence and and get it more towards taking shots at the opponent, but I just I didn't like any of it. Mm-hmm. Whatever reason, like the, the mean girl, but the the burn book and stuff, it just it didn't it didn't land with me, and she didn't she didn't finish strong either. Um, but it was a complete opposite in a match because, and I guess it was supposed to come off like the bigger girl was like the underdog, um, but she's you know she very much came off in the match like like a bully. But it's weird because I feel like neither of them played. One girl didn't, you know, do as much as she could have as the bigger girl, and the other girl didn't do as much as she could as the the little person put stacking on the offense to stun and then hopefully put down the opponent. So it very much came off like prodding and slow and awkward at times. Like they were trying to find little spots, and if it, if that was like a radio segment, it was a lot of dead air. Mm. Um, but um, the the guys match, I liked it. Like it, it totally told a story. Obviously, like you said, George South. Like the epitome of old school, so much so taunting the taunting the audience in the middle of stuff, and uh, very much sticking to to one maneuver for most of the match, and the, the kid had to fight back. So, you know, I th- just thought he told a similar story. It looked good. Like you said, for as old as he is, he hit some very uh, standard but effective maneuvers. So, yeah, Colby Carino's you know, like, uh, uh, her name's Freya the Slayer, by the way. Freya the Slayer. Yeah. Yeah, not a great name. Uh, Kobe, on the other hand, is a remarkably well trained, well disciplined, great seller. So, uh, like all of his his moves are going to be crisp, and, and even if they're really, really unique, I think people are going to be truly impressed with with uh, with him. Yeah. One of the, thing, the things that I always kind of point out is like you can do common moves, but put a little twist to it. There was a time when when people were doing the vertical suplex where it would just be a straight up and over. I forget who it was, but they started to kind of angle them. I think it may have been Dean Malenko or, or someone of, of that elk. And, and they started to angle it more. So like when he took them up, it was more of an, uh, on an angle and it kind of gave it a, like a differential, a be, uh, maybe a more better version of this uh, scenario would be the, the power bomb. There's a lot of different ways you can do a power bomb. You know, you got the jackknife, you got the lowdown, you got the sit out, you got the standing, you got the triple, you got the corner. So many different ways, and and it's about finding that little that little twist that makes it yeah. your own. I think Kobe does a great job with that. Uh, as for the women, uh, this um, Danny Jordan, first and foremost, you need a better name. Secondly, she's not unattractive, so 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 don't go in that realm with what I'm about to say. She's not quote unquote pretty. To be this mean girl character. If she's going to play into a stereotype, she has to look the stereotype. A mean girl is super, super buttoned up. Super, super kind of engulfed in fashion. She's got usually either blonde hair or dyed blonde hair. She's always wearing, you know, $100 shirts or blouses, whatever the fuck they're called. You know, high heels. Essentially, what the you know the last good version of the Mean Girl gimmick was the beautiful people like they fit that stereotype to a T. This woman is extremely beautiful. Do not take that out of context. But she's not in that you know that blonde plastic Barbie doll you know um, Valley Girl kind of pretty. She she's a different kind of pretty, uh, and, and I think she needs to kind of be aware of that because it. When you're trying to do this type of a bullying gimmick, you need to make it work. I could not go do a bullying gimmick in wrestling. I'm 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, when my back's not fucked. What am I going to do? Bully most of the roster who's taller than me? No. Moose, on the other hand, can. You know what Moose can't do? Play the little baby face, I'm in peril! Because that won't work. That's why John Cena was always kind of maligned. Because when they made him from that super hardcore, I'm a get you rapper to the, huh, I'm just, I'm just so happy to be here. Golly, gosh, gee willikers. And, you know, he's fighting Shane Helms and Hornswoggle. And Hornswoggle's like doing 25 minutes of damage on Cena. And then Cena does the comeback and win. Like he, he, he yeah. did that for everyone. And no one believed yeah, it. Because the dude's fucking jacked. 
very predictable, formulaic, and still to this day cannot throw a punch. Nope. <laughs> but the thing with Cena was is had you booked him like Batista or Goldberg, where he's this, you know, gnarly, violent, animalistic slayer, ah, he would have been over like Rover. Because look at Batista. Batista's got like four and a half moves and half a kneecap. And like a more tattoos than he ever should have gotten, but that's neither here nor there. And Batista was super over for all but like six months of his career when they made him blue <laughs> and tried to book him against Daniel Bryan. That was not his week. But like Cena, better athlete, better performer, better wrestler, better marketability, and yet this motherfucker can't get over or stay over with the entire audience because he's booked to look like a giant doofus every week. I don't know. So, uh, you know, when I look at this Jordan, uh, Danny Jordan girl, I think to myself, she's got a very punk look. She's got a very alt lifestyle kind of rhythm to her. And I think if she were to embrace that, because like even her shirt kind of had that punky kind of lettering to it. Uh, let's see if I can't find it. Here we go. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's funny because one of the first things she said when she saw a promo, he was like, um, and maybe this had to do with the fact that the uh, Freya the Slayer didn't actually say her name because, like I said, I think she got caught up in nerves to begin with and she was trying to remember everything she wanted to say. But um, Marquez asked uh, Danny, he was like, uh, so what's your name? And she was like, can't you freaking read? Because it's on a shirt. And then I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm backseat quarterback, and I'm like, not, not with that shitty font. <laughs> <laughs> we use that font a lot, so... Point taken, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, I think trying to pivot from this mean girl shtick into being more of a punk rebel, you know, you can't tell me what to do, dad, type of gimmick, I think would work a lot better for her. Um, it, it also would appeal to her, um, her physical stature because when you're someone of that alternative lifestyle, that punk rhythm of life, if you will, you don't really take to being told too well that you can't do something. Punk is very DIY. Do it yourself. You're four foot ten. Guess what? You tell me I can't fight, I'm a fight. Why? Because you told me I can't. I was going to sit here and paint and eat cherries all day, but now you told me I shouldn't fight big chicks, and I'm going to fight big chicks because I fucking do it. And I think if, if she embraced that kind, of, uh, um, that kind of mentality, I think she might have a, a better opportunity to, to advance and do well. Both these young ladies though look impressive to a, to a degree. I'm going to have to watch this match back. But there's this great shot of them almost, you know, head to head, face to face. Danny's barely above the top rope with her head and she comes up to slay the, uh, Taya the Slayer or Faya the, Faya the Slayer? Faye the Slayer? Faye Slayer. Yeah, Freya, yeah. Freya. She's from Alaska. Yeah, she's from Alaska. Well, at least she's not from Mongrovia. <laughs> Although, if you ask me, Alaska's nothing more than a myth. Who's ever been to Alaska? Am I right? I'm kidding, people. I know Alaska's real. It's right next to Narnia. So she's, you know, uh, Danny's like up to Freya's chest. <laughs> so like, it's it's a really great shot, and they picked the two right people because this is a great uh, looking aesthetic. Too bad the fucking referee's out of the goddamn position. You know, if he was half as smart as he thinks he is, he'd be in the middle of them, so he'd be, you know, kind of a counterpoint. But, you know, that's the photographer in me. Well, what you gonna do? Overall, Marcus, do you think Kobe Carino, George South, Freya the Slayer, or Danny Jordan should get a, a contract with the NAA? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, I'd love to see, you know... Um... You know, just a journey with with young Carino. Um, I think Joel South is, you know, as much of a true throwback as he is. He's he's got you know he's got some history there. You know, definitely, obviously got history with Carino. And you know, like I said, he feel he feels like the the silent younger than the well, he feels like he could be the silent younger than NWA. Yeah, George South, I think, is like in his late fifties or early sixties. And I saw him. I'm like, holy shit. I'd like to look that good at 35, let alone 60. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see him getting there. Um, because like I said, I was impressed by him because the moves he was hitting was 
very uh, simple move like Belly to Belly. She did a beautiful uh, butterfly suplex. Um, but yeah, I like to see him get in there and mix it up, maybe like a Tim Storm or um, uh, um, why is his name escaping me? Uh, Thom. Not Sienna. Thom. The, uh, <laughs> friggin' he was uh, not Garrison. Garrison Cage part in the rest of so. Trevor Murdoch. Um, yeah, Murdoch. There it is. Um, yeah, I like to see him get in there and mix it up with those guys. You know, I think they could uh, do some just some real smash mouth stuff, and those those would be some real good promos because obviously he's got some age on Storm, um, uh, and maybe even Murdoch because uh, I think Murdoch may look older than he actually is. Murdoch's forty, but, uh, I think. Okay, well, right about right, right about about on point, but uh, I feel like he could, you know, they could do some real good uh, verbal jabs back and forth, so. Yeah, I think he fit right in. Like I said, I'd like to see a journey with somebody like Carino, maybe some guys like, uh, you know, all this kind of picking on the kid, or, you know, just him catching all kinds of hell from Strictly Business and them ha- having to fight back and whatnot. That'll be some cool stuff. And I th- I like to see what somebody like the size of Freya could evolve into. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm kind of kind of on the fence with with Danny, but she could she could find a place as well. She probably benefit from starting out with a starting out in a stable and maybe finding a footing. I have a place like for that. Danny. Get out, get that out of your mind, you pervs. I meant in the ring <laughs> and on a date if she's interested. Uh, the thing with Frey is a lot of women her size usually carry a little bit too much extra weight to be really viable in the ring. You know, that's a big issue with Nia Jax. You know, she's very plotting. You know, that's an issue with um, Viper. You don't want to be so overweight that you have mobility issues. And that was a big issue with Falaba. You know, when Falaba came in, yeah. that dude sucked. Yeah, now nah, he's all over the place, literally. Yeah, now he's dropped about 100 pounds and he's flying around like goddamn Samoa Joe circa 2005, only with less athleticism because I don't think... Falaba could get over the top rope with a stepladder, let alone jumping. <laughs> but like he's he did, making improvements, well, people. If he like like if he did poetry in motion, he still might not clear it. Like <laughs> if he did poetry in motion, it'd be called a rock. It'd be called a boulder. It would be called a stop sign. Because he couldn't move. <laughs> but my point, original point is. Freya looks like she's got some good athleticism, uh, just from the brief that I've seen. She's in fair enough shape for a woman her size, which is really good, because a- athletic big women are not common in wrestling. You know, like you- you're either like 290 pounds like Awesome Kong, or you're seven six ten like Isis the Amazon. <laughs> Remember yeah. her? I do. No, uh, you don't. Yeah, re- it's, it's- you okay? <laughs> but uh but no i mean it, it's, it's i mean i guess to some of what you were saying about you know the bigger girls that come off they end up coming off as like a lummox mm-hmm. and and it, it, it's bad and what we've seen you know anaya just kind of botch it up um and you know a lot of that stuff it ends up not doing too well with the wear and tear on the body and the joints is specifically depending on what they try to do especially if they're trying to get innovative and doing stuff with um same you know same size girls are they getting some getting there with somebody like sasha banks and they try to get overly creative mm-hmm. which really in a fit them so yeah it, it doesn't uh we've yet to see somebody be able to move like a samoa joe uh, in terms of the women in that regard yeah i think if you know i've seen a lot of piper niven stuff and i think she's or Viper or whatever her name is. Um, if she were to, I think, drop maybe 30 pounds, like she's got some hops. I don't think, yeah. you know, she's maybe, what, 5'8"? Joe is like 6'2", so maybe she doesn't have the height to get over the top, but, but I think she could be that kind of Samoa Joe prototype for the women. Um, that and she's got like a button cute face, so like you could have a lot of fun with, with the marketing her as... Um, you know, as a, as a Samoan submission kind of uh, Samin for, for, for the women, and also kind of like, oh, and she's also cute as fuck. So there's, there's, there's a lot of 
you know, like we're in this women's era of wrestling that's never like I've never seen it this good in terms of talent available. But the difference, like the problem is like we're looking at it in like a 1980s male side of things. Like you only have the athletic wrestler or the really big bully wrestler. And there's not a lot of diversity in that regard. Like you got Natty who does the shoot style and Sarah Del Rey did the shoot style and she did it really well. But you don't see a lot of women doing that well. I mean, you got Shauna Basler, who's all right with it. Uh, what's her face with uh, with Mandy Rose? Um, oh, you're talking about uh, Sonya Deville. Yeah, Sonya Deville, but hers is l- pretty inauthentic. You know, like, oh, you had a fight once with a pillow? Super MMA over here. Then you got Shauna Basler, who's a well-traveled MMA veteran. Ronda Rousey, who was a UFC champion, I'm supposed to believe Shauna Baszler. Not Shauna Baszler. Uh, Sonya Deville's on the same level as these women? Please. When Ken <coughs> Chan... <when> Ken <coughs> Chan- <laughs> What's that? First of all, you're going with the wrong narrative with Sonya Deville. <coughs> you're forgetting your, your colors. I am not forgetting my colors. I have one color. Platinum blonde. Sup, Mandy? <laughs> Uh, 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 AJ, could you help? Like, hey, come on, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, AJ. Thank you. We were missing a bit. I'm glad you found it. <laughs> um, but with like uh, uh, Ken Shamrock, when he came in, legitimate best fighter in the world at the time. There's a debate, and I I think this is a a, a honest to god debate in a MMA shoot fight. Ken Shamrock could probably beat Mike Tyson in 97. And let's be honest, the only thing beating Mike Tyson was the rap and his ego. <laughs> People weren't beating Mike Tyson. <laughs> I mean, Evander Holyfield had to lose an ear to beat him. <laughs> There's consequences to fighting prime Mike Tyson. <laughs> He'll take pieces of you, literally. And Shamrock was so good, he probably was the only fighter in the world who could have, you know, really gone with him. Um... Because Tyson would have, he would have crumpled Royce, Royce Gracie, just crumpled him, just crumpled him to bits. So uh, I think, uh, you know, long story short, this Freya has a real opportunity to find a niche that isn't really being occupied in wrestling, uh, a mobile big woman. Because, you know, let's be honest, Tamina, she's only there because who her dad was. And Nia's only there because they could sell the body positivity angle to the media. Because if we're going on talent, neither of those women have any. <laughs> Still looking. So, Marcus, I sent you a photo of Isis the Amazon. Did you get it? Let me see here. Please show up in my... I, no. I don't know why it's not coming up on uh, Skype for me. Okay. Well, well, I'll send it to you on the, on the Twitter. Get you all up. Uh, <laughs> I pulled it up and I'm, I'm like, why did he send me Harriet? I'm like, that's me from the other week, Jesus. Oh yeah, because <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't believe that there was two moms on. Uh... Oh, I can't remember the show's name. Family Matters. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They all, all those shows in nine in 1992 had the same name. Family Matters, Home Ties, Family Ties, Home Family Ties Matters, and then he had Fresh Prince of Bel Air. They knew what they were doing. Yeah, that wasn't home improvement in the 90s, too? Yes. So they had yeah. a unique name as well. But, like, step-by-step, step, I don't even... I remember Cody was in step-by-step. Step. Sounds like something's burning. I don't see any houses on fire. Probably my house. <laughs> if it's not the CTE or the coronavirus, it's going to be me burning my house down by accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so I, I, D, I DM'd you. I slid your DMs, Marcus. Yeah. Yes, let's see here. Holy Jesus. Um, Shh. Y- yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know who, who Isis is, uh, she's the uh, the black-haired one with the black dress thing. <laughs> no, obviously, that's, that's AJ Lee. Isis is this one. This big, hearty woman. You're I think Alvana she's... Drago. Right? I think she's 6'8". She's a uh, she's a lanky gal. If she's now somewhere being somebody's security, I don't. Right? 
She's six eight. She was supposed to, um, she was supposed to debut in the WWE with that the all women NXT season, but apparently she had some risque photography. <laughs> oh no. That's the rumor. We haven't seen it, but... So. She has a son. That dude better at least clear 6'5". <laughs> wow, that's it's crazy. That That's not Photoshop. Like, she literally <laughs> just, just... Yeah, she's literally that tall. She was the and first... And she's in the heel, too? Yeah. Oh. I, I, I say this not joking at all. I bet they had to have those boots specially made. There's not a lot of demand for a 6'8 woman to be in high heels. Even most NBA women or WNBA women are only like, like you know, 6'6 six, six for the centers. So I don't know. I think she missed her calling as a, uh, as a pro basketball player. <laughs> she could have been the Shaq of the WNBA. Man. The big she is style. So now that we've you know gotten women's groups pissed off at us for the month, happy national, happy uh, uh, women's month, by the way, folks. <clears throat> Let's talk about something that should really make you mad, and that's fucking elimination chamber. God damn, Marcus, what the hell even happened? I don't. know. What should have never happened was the show. Um, that had to be. The most garbage elimination chamber. I mean, it's one of the most garbage pay per views they've had. Uh, certainly, the year uh, I say in the past few years, um, certainly the worst paper, the elimination chamber uh, that they've had, got to be ever. It was just, it, it was bad. Like they had some moments in the tag team match, but even that wasn't good. And the women's, and I tweeted this. I'm like, they did no worse. Shayna did no worse to those women in that chamber than the creative has done for years, specifically Natty. So, yeah, let's be honest about that one. So, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder made it to the pre-show. So did the Viking Raiders. Worst name ever. Viking Raiders. Ugh. Daniel Bryan defeated Drew Gulak by what the fuck's a technical submission? I cover MMA. There's no such thing as a technical submission. There's a submission. <laughs> There's a technical knockout, which is where it's essentially that the athlete's still conscious, but it can no longer defend himself. But a technical submission is honestly just a submission. So, so, so was it the whole so awkward looking you couldn't classify it as a submission, but Gulak tapped anyway? <laughs> Did Gulak tap? I didn't fucking watch this show. <laughs> I definitely didn't watch the pre-show. Um... Or the, the top half of the show. So, no, I didn't probably didn't catch this match either. But, I mean, I didn't have no qualms about who was going to win the match. No. So. And, honestly, this is a match that I might go back to watch because Drew Gulak is I – mean, I don't want to say he's on Daniel Bryan's level because, let's be honest, that's not possible. <laughs> like, there's four people as, as workers – that I would say were, are on Daniel Bryan's level as a technical wrestler. There's Dean Malenko, Bret Hart. I would give the nod to Zachary Sabre Jr. He's pretty good. And then Bryan Danielson, Daniel Bryan. He, you know, that's all. It's a small fucking list. That's God tier. But right below God tier, the Chad tier. That's where Drew Gulak is. He's pretty good. So I'm sure this match was, was fantastic, but like. Did he win by the LaBelle lock? Did he win by a dragon sleeper? Because usually when it's a submission, it's Daniel Bryan defeated Drew Gulak by armbar. Daniel Bryan defeated Drew Gulak by a rear naked choke. Or Daniel Bryan defeated Drew Gulak by tickling him in the abdomen. I'd like to see someone win by tickling someone with a feather. Like, I'd like to see that be printed in Wikipedia for the rest of the Internet's history. Drew Gulak lost by being tickled by a feather. I'd pay to see that shit. Uh, Andrade defeated Humberto Carrillo. Remember when he was someone that people were really excited about? Probably when he debuted, not a day since. Um, he's had about as many shots at this U.S. strap as uh, Batista had 
That time where they just kept putting him in the matches against Edge. <laughs> and he lost every oh. fucking one. <laughs> but the he... only ever. <laughs> What's that? He was only the... he was the only contender for like a year. <laughs> yup. But he did allow CM Punk to win the belt. Because Batista's like, hey, what's up, bitch? And Edge's like, ah, fuck a Roni. Yeah. It's the time for the beatdown. <laughs> and then CM Punk's like, did I hear a beatdown? <laughs> Came out and he won. So the Miz and John Morrison retained over the New Day, the Usos, Heavy Machinery, Lucha House Party, and Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode. Remember when Bobby Roode was someone everyone's like, oh, he's going to be a world champion on SmackDown. He's, he's the face of the future of the prom-. And I'm like, no, he's not. Well, bitches, the immortal words of Avenged Sevenfold, hail to the king. And, you know, Ash, hail to the king, baby. So, Marcus, thoughts on, uh, did you see this Elimination Chamber match? Yeah, I did. Uh, just, uh, specifically, like I said, it had some decent moments, but for the most part, and, and the freaking highlights, most of the highlights of the match come from the team, that was least likely to win anything, which is the freaking Lucha House Party. Because of the stuff they did. I, think I forgot who it was exactly, but climbed out to the top of the cage and, and basically did a drop salt uh, on top of everybody. But it, the setup was so crazy because everybody was down as he was climbing. And then all of a sudden, everybody woke from the dead and get in positions while we fake punch. Like, it looked so stupid. Um, and then they also did the spot where Otis ran through a pod out of the out of the chamber, and hit the floor. So <laughs> that would have been funny if like a Mandy Rose was on the other end of it. Oh God! Now, now, well, let me rephrase because I know how that's on. Um, not on on the other side of the pod, but like if Mandy Rose was like outside the cage and like Otis is trying to get to her and he just runs to the fucking pod and he's like he's reaching for her. like that. That shit would have been fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but um. It, it was it was mundane and monotonous, and uh, I mean at least it's on Miz and Morrison, which ain't saying much because as much as they probably want to believe they are, they kind of they dead in the water too. I feel like the the tag titles will fought, be far better served on Rude and Ziggler at this point because the best energy in the division right now is with Heavy Machinery, specifically with Otis, who to me is more over than anybody in that match right now. Mm-hmm. So. You know, it'd be better served to get them towards a WrestleMania match and then eventually, of course, have them get the straps at Mania. But Otis not only getting the belt, but the girl, I mean, too. So, uh, but that... <laughs> to doing the right thing. I have an alternative theory or an alternative pitch. Like, let's go Vince Russo territory twists here, right? So let's have... At the end of it, Liv Morgan still spurns. Wait, is that the right one? Mandy Rose. That's that's the one. Let's have Mandy Rose still spurn the advances of Otis, but have Mandy also spurn Dolph and go to um, what's her name? No, I'm showing you the video. Yeah, there it is. I don't know why I can't remember her name. I'm so sorry. Have her go to Sonya Deville and have Mandy Rose confess her love to Sonya Deville and have Sonya go, I'm in love with someone else. And Mandy's like, who? And then she turns to Otis and go, with Otis. And then everyone's like, wait, Sonya Deville's in love with Otis? And Otis is all like, oh, yeah. So, like, I don't know. That's Vince Russo area to twists and turns. <laughs> I think it'd be great. <laughs> it'd be terrible. But this product's already terrible. I can't muck it up worse. And what comes next? Hashtag bisexual backlash. (laughs) That'd be the greatest name for a fucking (laughs) post-WrestleMania pay-per-view ever. (laughs) Bisexual. You just do do the old backlash uh, uh, swinging, what is it, pendulum, you know, entrance again. But instead of it just being backlash, you know, it says backlash on the top end. But then, like, the pendulum has the word bisexual on it while it swings back and forth. Oh no, they just rainbow side. <laughs> <laughs> so I like Miz and Morrison as champions, but who you know, this is the problem with the WWE. When no one's special, who the fuck cares? 
Who was the Miz and the Morrison? And the Morrison. I speak the big words. Who's the Miz and Morrison going to face at WrestleMania to make this feel like, like it matters? They already went through all the teams. Well, Chad, you know, it's always only between New Day and Uso because they've not had enough shots and or title reign. Jesus Christ. If I have another New Day Uso's match, I'm just – well, I'm not going to watch. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> um, you know, Street Profits, you know, they're, they're coming up on the Raw side of things. Um, wait, did the, did the Street Profits win the titles? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't hear – I'm seeing it. The Street Profits defeated – Rollins and Murphy, but I'm I didn't hear. Oh, they were already the champions. When the f- <laughs> I didn't hear shit about this. <laughs> yeah, it happened on Raw. Call well, that's the, why. Uh, now, <laughs> a now or never match. Oh, I wonder how that's gonna go. Oh God! <laughs> didn't telegraph that at all. <laughs> now or never, loser leave towns. Babyface got to get their hair shaved. We all know how it's gonna. Like, don't telegraph it. Um, but, like, you know, the Street Profits, you know, coming up on Raw. Now, you know, they're the champions now. But my, my whole point was that they're, they're in a position to be a, the champions eventually. Now that they're champions, that almost, you know, re- reasserts my position. Who, who's left for SmackDown? Shorty G and Apollo Crews. Okay, that's not actually a bad idea. Drop the Shorty J name. Drop the, the Apollo Crews name. What's that? They beefing right now. Oh, God damn it. Because Apollo took it upon himself like, I don't need your help after we both got our asses kicked by Seamus. I'll deal with things my way. Is that a boot coming to my face? <laughs> <laughs> I can just see now. Uh, Apollo Crews is like, I can do this myself. And then you cut right to Seamus about to kick him in the, in the face. And then everything stops. And he goes, and this is when Apollo Crews knew he made a mistake. <laughs> Eats the fucking boot. So, <laughs> I like. I, what, what are they beefing over? Who's the shortest person in the WWE? Like this is the fucking battle scene from Cobra Kai season two all over again. When the two little little little, little uh, uh, nuggets of fun started fighting each other, but they were so dorky they just got carried off. <laughs> That's Gable and Uha. By the by, drop the fucking. Apollo Crew, that's so bad. It's so bad. And let them go by Uha Nation again because it's so great. But of course, you're going to have, you know, confrontations with Roman Reigns because every time he goes to do the damn Superman punch, he goes, Ooh, ah! And then, like, every, ooh, ooh, actually, you know what? You can do a, 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 an angle with that. Every time he does it, you just see him, you see uh, Apollo Crew's poke his head up from underneath the ring or, like, uh, in the audience. You, you need some, Roman? <laughs> Roman's like, no, no, I'm good. Uh, he's like, oh, you, you called my name, so I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm saying I'm here. That's, that's, that's Roman's new thing. Now he's just beefing with people who do or say things too close to his gimmick. Goldberg, then ooh ha. Um, as the kids say, Marks, I'm gonna keep it 100. I'm super excited for Roman Goldberg. I don't know why. It's probably gonna be bad, but I'm gonna watch it. <laughs> and then he start calling out, calling out legends. <laughs> Like, who could I call out? Who had a vest? Oh, boss man, I'm calling you out for us. <laughs> uh, boss man's lost a little bit of weight these days. <laughs> you know, all of it. <laughs> oh, geez. So, Alistair Black defeated uh, AJ Styles. Was that any good? No, because it was a disqualification match and. <laughs> The freaking, they had, I don't know how much stupider they could make Gallows and Anderson look, but they, they act like they didn't know that they was in a no DQ match. And they literally, like, waited till the last half of the match to start attacking Black. And that was half the point of it being no DQ in the first place. Um, so, I mean, it had some moments of brutality, but, no. And then the Undertaker showed up uh, because they ganged up on him at the end and gave his second Horrible looking show slam. There you go. Are they building up an Aleister Black and Undertaker match against AJ Styles in the club? Like, is, is that what they're doing? I don't know. They may do something like that before WrestleMania, but who knows? 
like I said, I don't even know if they want to get have him have any type of physical contact before he gets to the match, so he can save every bit of morsel of strength for that Mania match. Then we got uh, Street Profits one. I'm sure you were happy about that because I think you're a Street Profits fan. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I like those guys a lot. I'm not a fan of uh, just the way that they dulled them down on the main roster, but that's per. That's that's, that's the, the, the narrative. Yeah, that's the narrative with NXT call-ups. Um, they they come off looking real, this real uh, white toastish, you know, with their swag. It's been severely uh, dimmed. Why is it gotta be white toast, Marcus? Because <laughs> it's hard to digest. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, like, I am not staring away from this joke. I'm going all in. I'm just like, I respect that. I respect that. Uh, apparently, Sami Zayn won the Intercontinental Championship. Although it says Sami Zayn, Shinsuke, and Cesaro won the Intercontinental Championship, so I don't fucking know. <laughs> we. We are the, no, it's just me. I'm the champion. I'm the IC, I'm the IC champion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's anybody but Strowman, right? So talking about Ober and Lummox. Lummox is er, from earlier, you know. He's anyone but them, the like, strap. It's terrible. It looks yeah, so oh, bad. yeah. Have we, have we ever talked about the new design with that? Like, it's that, not I don't good. Know who that is. <laughs> like, they took... It was remember, random, too, Remember the blue Intercontinental title from the 90s and early 2000s? Like, yeah. They, they twisted it sideways, dipped it in gold, and said, here. Uh, I mean, I look, look the, the the one that we kind of came up with in the 90s was fine, that the, the oval-shaped one, and then, obviously, um, Cody fought to, to bring back, I mean, that was part of his gimmick, bringing back some classic stuff. He brought the classic strap back, and then they just, uh, they. I'm guessing they thought a new design was gonna put, make it feel more important. But you kind of have to defend it and make it a key point on the show to make it like they, they idea of make what makes stuff relevant is hilarious. You ain't wrong. Uh, Shanna Basler, Shanna, Shanna. She, uh, she did the thing and she won the thing and now she's the uh, the women's uh, contender at uh, the WrestleMania thing. Yeah. I don't have an issue with this. Uh, I don't have an issue with how they did it. I didn't see it, so it may have been trash. But then again, with all, or no, due respect, Sarah Logan, Ruby Riot, Natalia, Liv Morgan, you weren't coming with the best of names anyway. You know, like you, you, I love Ruby Riot. Uh, Sarah Logan, before she came to the WWE, was fantastic, but now she's lost whatever charm she had. Natalia's. 37, 38, and has been wrestling since she was 14. And she's f- looking like it, like physically. Like, you can tell she is not the same worker she used to be. Liv Morgan is just attractive, and I hate to be that guy who says it, but it's not like Liv Morgan has much to offer. And Asuka's hurt and hasn't been relevant in two years. Like, what did you think was going to happen with this show? This is like going to a a whipping contest where people whip you and then being mad that you whipped. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? Oh, yeah. fans are dumb. <laughs> and again, we'll eventually give out our complaint Twitter. Um, yes, it's, uh, yeah. it's at can... WWE. We changed the name. Yeah. 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 Just uh, simplified it for you folks. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, we know the check's clear, but even if, you know, you want to debate what we say. I mean, look, it's you can like these people as much as you want to, but you have to acknowledge what their characters are on these shows. doesn't matter how much they motivate you on Instagram or whatever narrative you want to follow with. These characters don't mean squat on this show. Like This is a company that made Oscar feel like the sickest thing in the world and then one of the most irrelevant people to ever come through the company. It's the same company that made Shinsuke Nakamura feel like he was Heath freaking Slater. I think a better way of putting that, and, and, it, and it goes to what, what I think you're trying to imply, is they made Shinsuke Nakamura feel like just another person. Yeah. Oh, but he was the artist, so you know. <laughs> so, I want to get wing stops. So we're going to cut WrestleMania for the conversation, because 
We have plenty of time to talk about WrestleMania. <clears throat> I'm excited for the Goldberg and the Reigns. Yeah, I, I, I think my excitement is with um, just because of the the emotions there. They they actually building it right. I mean, I put let's see, Edge and Orton first, uh, Lesnar and McIntyre after that, and then uh. Yeah, I put Goldbergs and Reigns and then Styles and Undertaker just because you don't know what you're going to get. The interests will be cool. Hell, maybe Undertaker's interest might be longer than the day of match. We don't know. Uh, uh, can I get a lull Lesnar wins for WrestleMania, please? That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Drew. I never got Drew. And even when he was putting on some good matches in, Re- in Impact, I was like, all right, I still don't find you interesting. Scott Steiner, though. Uh, collapsed backstage at an Impact show. I think it was Friday night or Saturday night. I think it was Friday night. And, um, you know, immediately everyone's like, oh, he died. And, and I'm like, no, he didn't. Scott Steiner doesn't die. He just had a momentary lapse of heartbeats. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, he went under the knife. And uh, apparently, while it was a serious situation, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was being uh, pointed out to be. Um, heart issues are never anything to mess with. You know, like there's no such thing as a as a minimal heart issue. <laughs> Let's be clear. But a lot of people are like life or death. All right, Sean Rossap, calm down. Um, he had a procedure; it alleviated the problem. He's going to make a 100 percent recovery, and uh, more than likely, he's going to miss the uh, the April show because if it was a heart episode or if he had a, a blockage to deal with, it takes about three to five weeks to even get going again. And then, you, you know, you're going to want to get back going. So maybe two to three months to bounce back. Uh, and let's be honest, if Jerry Lawler at 70, if Terry Funk at 74 can still wrestle, can still play fight, Scott Steiner can too. Um, more than likely, this is uh, from years of steroid abuse, though. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I'm not really. I mean, obviously, it's. It's either from Shoney's look- or steroids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. uh. <laughs> Like what? What are what are those pills now that they call that you can use um, to keep yourself big poppered and pumped uh, in the bedroom? But um, blue chew. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that's that's what I'm hearing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Scott Steiner. <laughs> Scott Steiner had a uh, had a medical stiffening that lasted more than six hours. And needed to go see a doctor. Oh, uh, medical stiffening. The stiffening. <laughs> the um, stiffening returns. <laughs> the stiffening three. Here comes... The boom? <laughs> no, just here it comes. That works even better. Oh, uh, here comes that, 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 that. Yeah. Uh, ooh, I was going to no, ask about ooh. that. Cause obviously... Here comes dot, 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 the stiffening three. <laughs> Yeah, we're taking this super seriously. Oh, man. If but, this... yeah, like you said, with Jerry Lawler, I mean, Jerry Lawler quite literally died at Raw, so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Lawler uh, uh, had his heart stopped three or four times. Technically speaking, you can only die once. Let's be clear. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, everyone's like, I was dead for five. No, you weren't. You You didn't have a heartbeat for five minutes, maybe. Maybe you didn't have any brain activity. But you ain't dead until the doctor says you dead. <laughs> and when you dead, there ain't no coming back. You, you in a box and a hole in the ground or a, in a cup of ashes. Let's be clear. But Scott Steiner, man, I, I'm, I'm tickled pink to find out that he's going to make a full recovery. And I didn't realize that he had kids. So, like, when I saw that photo of, like, Scott Steiner's wife and his kids, I'm like, wait, when did this happen? So I was mortally, I was mortified. And ironically, Rick Steiner, I think, is coming out of retirement to do a uh, uh, like a one-off match with somebody. You know, at least that's what I read. It may have been an old article. Now. I don't even remember. So, like, this is all that's, just a weird month for the Steiner family. That that's classic. That of course, all the people, <laughs> of course, only in the world of wrestling would be like, wait a minute, Scott Steiner has kids, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Like all these years, and he's he's been been. Literally hustling us this whole time. He's been the we, we're gonna get a document on. He's a perfect family man, and all these years we think he's been like a more I guess abrasive flair <laughs> in that regard. Um, 
Oh well, man, that's uh, yeah. I'm just glad that he's okay. Uh, it's cool to see everybody come out and support him on Twitter. Uh, it always sucks when people jump to the death note, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, uh, we all in age where people rather be first and factual. So, um, so apparently, team Z mentality. Apparently, yeah. Scott's wife, his name is Krista. They've been married for nearly for twenty years. What the flying duck is this? <laughs> Yes, keeping business, business, and I guess private, private. Right? Better than most. I could just imagine, like, how if you hear me? You hoochies with the hookup. You know, ladies are tramps and blah. And then, like, he goes to, to the PTA meeting. M- M- Mr. Steiner here. Uh, it's Scott Ray Steiner, just to be clear. And, uh, you know, I think I think we have too much violence in school. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all right turning gym class into that giant yeah, uh, uh, a tent class. I think that would work. You know, kids, kids, kids can. It's too violent, Tom. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Man just got down a carpooling, carpooling, but he didn't have time enough for leaving the show to change, so he pulls up in full regalia. <laughs> the headdress on. Uh, uh, son, uh, it, it's your father, uh, 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 Papa Scott. Uh, son, screw you, old man. Oh, I'm sorry, young fellow. Uh, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just love the idea of Scott Center being like. Fucking so chill in real life. Instead of big booty daddy on the license plate, just say big duty daddy. <laughs> Goddamn. So we know that Scott's nephew is Bronson Reshiner, I think. And apparently he's training to be a pro wrestler, but it, did I see this right? Is Scott's son's name Brock? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. Scott Steiner has a son named Brock. <laughs> oh my god. I'm so minute, happy. What, what, what am I missing? What am I missing here? Scott Steiner has a son named Brock. <laughs> Brock Lesnar! <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> It's not that funny, but I think it's hilarious. It's even funny if you do the math. Well, <laughs> do the math with Scott Steiner. Jesus, we'll never get to the end. But uh, like, ah, uh, yeah, that uh, that uh, kind of makes sense. Apparently, Brock is. Um, he, I think he went to the same school as his cousin Bronson. Um, class of oh, twenty one. It looks like he's going to college to play football as a wide receiver. God, that would be all. Could you imagine being like a little seventeen year old cornerback? Lining up, and you just see a goddamn Steiner son across the line from you. <laughs> I don't care how good at football you think you are. When you see a Steiner, when you see a Steiner son staring you down, um, yeah, it's a bad day for you. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to know that Scotty's going to be okay, though. Speaking of okay, apparently yeah. Sue Young's going to be okay without impact because she's moving on, allegedly. I know this this, uh, this yeah. upsets you. Uh, not really. I mean, like, you know, um, we've seen a lot of moving parts and impact uh, throughout, you know, the, the last, you know, four or five years or whatnot. And, uh, you kind of get used to it. It's just interesting because she just got, she really just picked up some moment, momentum back on screen. But maybe, you know, obviously proud of our knowledge, this was kind of ramping up to her kind of having one last little hoorah and kind of closing things out for the character before we may not see her again. So look at it from that perspective, you kind of, you know, tying up loose ends before you uh, step out the door. It does seem like she did uh, another set of uh, tapings uh, for Impact at this past week's uh, uh, weekend t- uh, TV outing. Uh, but it looked like she was putting over, I think she... I, I won't say who she put over because I don't want to ruin anything, but um, yeah. it, it, she put over a name or two, I think, on her way out. I don't know why she's leaving. Uh, truthfully, I, I kind of see her as a Matt Hardy type. Not very good in the ring, but a very good character. And I don't know yeah. which promotion is going to give her the same type of creative uh, freedom and authenticity to have a say in how she's presented. You know, everyone's first thought is she's either going to NXT or AEW. So, you know, we'll see what happens with her going forward. Um, she might come back for all we know. I don't know. 
Uh, and the real question is, what does this mean for Rich Swan? What does this mean for Swan and Sue as a couple? You know, we know that Taya and Johnny aren't getting a divorce out, I'm aware of. So, <clears throat> you know, if, if you're leaving, it's usually because you're leaving for a better offer or because you don't like your spouse anymore. Johnny left because he had a really good offer. Did Sue get a really good offer? That's my thought is that she got a really good offer. You know, I, I haven't heard any matrimonial issues between her and Rich. So my thought is that she got a really good offer. So where is she going to go? That's that's the question. Yeah, yeah. You think we, uh, do we think Rich is coming back? Because this go, we talked about this before. Couples tend to go. But we, only, we ain't really seen it with Ty. And I, you know, still wholeheartedly believe that she's far better off in impact and attempting to go join her husband because he ain't exactly lighting the world on fire right now either. Um even though he's a tag champ, I just don't think she's she gained any true momentum or get any type of creative freedom. Obviously, no creative freedom going to trying to be a uh, about to call them divas, but a woman in WWE. So I don't know. You know, I don't know where she's going to end up, Marcus, and I, I don't know if that means Swan's going to leave either, uh, because I yeah. don't think Ty is leaving. At least not yet. So. It, yeah. You know, it's it's going to be interesting. Maybe she's going to be doing work with Ring of Honor for all I know. You know they're trying to revive yeah. the women's division. Like I said, it was mildly surprising, but not devastating. Like, I, like if this was Rosemary, that would be devastating. Yeah, this isn't Rosemary or Tessa, or even Ty in that regard. Sue was a very good character, but I don't know how much more you could have done with it. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see where she goes and how Impact develops from there. <clears throat> um, just kind of a little note of reference before we move on. I, I've been a reader of Pro Wrestling Illustrated for 20 years. I still buy the magazine. I know I'm that guy. <laughs> I buy magazines. I'm so retro. I like the, tic- the, the tactile nature of a magazine as opposed to swiping on a screen. I don't know. Call me weird. Plus, I don't need to worry about battery life with a magazine. So... Stu Sachs has been the publisher, and not the publisher, the editor for the magazine. Uh, no, he's been the publisher. I was right. Uh, going back to 1992, and he announced that he's stepping back, uh, and that he'll be dipping his feather in the ink one last time on June 5th. Uh, he, he thanks everyone involved, and you can read the whole announcement on PWI's um, Twitter account. And he kind of su- sums it up really great. He goes, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. It's, it's not that long. It's with a broad range of emotions that I announce I will be retiring and stepping down as editor and publisher of Pro Wrestling Illustrated on June 5th. <clears throat> I've, developed two thir- I've devoted two-thirds of my life to this magazine and its sister publications, and believe me, it's not easy to walk away. I have expressed my gratitude to our original owner, Stanley Wetson. In the past, he was a wonderful, generous man who loved wrestling and boxing, as well as the wonderful staff he assembled and pretty much left alone to do their thing. But I also want to thank our current owner, Nick Carabouts, and the COPPA CEO, Des McNulty, those vision, uh, whose vision has enabled, in, uh, in, eh, 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 whose, in, in, whose vision has enabled PWI to thrive in an era that proved too increasingly challenging for print publications. I also want to thank the many, many coworkers I've seen come and go, each of whom proved crucial to my professional and personal growth. Most of all, I want to thank the readers who have supported PWI for all the, for all or some of the past forty years. I am extremely confident that we will thrive under the direction of our new editor, Kevin McVolvany. Mc, 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 ah, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'll just make it worse. Who has been a contributor for the past decade. For the short time he's been on uh, uh, on a full-time basis, it's, he's, it's clear to see that he has a range, uh, a love for the magazine and industry as a whole. He's quite a bit younger than me, who isn't. And he has a boatload of ideas on how to uh, modernize our approach, part, uh, p- particularly within the realm of social media while still maintaining PWI traditions that are so important to you, our readers. Beginning June 6th, I will be joining your ranks, Stu Sachs. I love the magazine. I loved his work with it, and I think he's done a remarkable job, and I look forward to seeing what he can do in the future on his own. Marcus, have you ever read PW, uh, PW Illustrated? <clears throat> no. It's a it, it's kind of a, a bit of a mixed bag in regards to how they present themselves. It, it's both a behind-the-scenes and also an in-character review of things. I think they should focus more on being more of an industry magazine and doing things that are comparable to what Dave Meltzer does on a a usual basis with actual news about the industry. But they're 500 for the men and 100, I think it's 100, 
or top 50 for the women are still highly vaunted positions and the awards at the end of the year still garner a lot of attraction. So it's not like they're a, um, a dated or past their prime type of magazine. I just think they need to pick a direction and go, um, which might happen under their new editor, <clears throat> new publisher. Um, so congrats and, and, you know, sayonara. I'll see you down the road. I should do a show one day about the WCW magazine and my love for it. But before we talk about love anymore, we have one last story for the night, and it's David Starr and WXW Germany mutually deciding to part ways, according to Dominic D'Angelo, because, quote, reportedly forced out by WWE. Let's, let's read this. I sent you, uh, did you get the link? You haven't been getting anything. Did you even get the link? Because if you didn't, it's on WrestleZone. <laughs> Just go to WrestleZone. Uh, the this past weekend was WXW's flagship 16 karat gold show, and it will be David Starr's last with the promotion. Starr lost to Bobby Guns, yep, with an S, in a title versus career match for the WXW Unified World Wrestling Championship, and a post-match Starr took to the ring and gave a heart to give a heartfelt goodbye to fans. Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer is reporting on his Wrestling Observer Radio this morning that Starr's removal from the promotion was all in part due to the relationship that WXW has with WWE. Starr took to Twitter to briefly address his WXW exit. I won't go into further detail regarding WXW on this platform, and I don't know when, if I will, in any public setting. Like I said, freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences, and this is with uh, and this mu- and that this mutual decision was one that neither of us wanted to make. I love WXW and always will. <clears throat> that very much does sound like he's being forced out. The article continues on saying Star has been very outspoken when it comes to topics surrounding WWE, which in turn has made him a very polarizing figure in the pro wrestling titan uh, to the pro wrestling titan up in Stanford, Connecticut. There was an instance in which uh, Star stomped on the WXW, uh, WWE excuse me, NXT UK Championship when he faced Walter at Over the Top in, uh, at, at an Over at the Top show in Ireland. Over the Top is the name of the promotion. And then also quit WXW in a promo that in, uh, integrated the evil corporation. <clears throat> Star also recently got into a Twitter spat with Evolve's Gabe Sapolsky, which is one of the primary promotions that WWE has ties with. Star operates the We the Independent movement in which he aims... All right, hang on. I know this is supposed to be a news story, but let's be clear. We the Independent is a clothing line that he's marketing as a quote-unquote movement in order to quote-unquote unionize the pro wrestling landscape. It's nothing more than a clothing outfit, though. Let's be clear. Let's not make this bigger than it is. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> he, he, he's that guy. He, he's, he's that little sycophant that pisses everyone off. Uh, Marcus, thoughts on this story and the potential damage or the potential uh, revelation that WWE could have had a hand in, in his removal? And do you think WWE should have had a hand in his removal if he was, in fact, removed from the promotion by the WWE? I mean, obviously, I mean, I think any type of... I can't put it past WWE to, to use something to get rid of any competition. <laughs> um, so, you know, you always got to leave that out because, you know, it's just it's just damn old. But, um... And I say if there's something went down and, and you know, like you said, it warranted his removal, then you can't be mad at that either. I mean, you know, um, we talk about shady stuff with WWE all the time, but they're not the only people in the industry doing stuff mm-hmm. that's shady. So, um, you know, if anything wasn't on the up and up, and uh, we but like we talked about a lot of uh, suspect stories in the last few years um, that even that had, had anything to do with the company. So, yeah, like I said, if it was warranted, then I'm glad they. Uh, got him up out of there, but uh, again, I do think it was a kind of, kind of easy kill two birds with one stone type of deal for WWE. Yeah, I, I think I'm of the mindset where this feels more like the WWE was like, you know, if you want to work with us any longer, Walter, you you have to let him go. I, I would not be surprised if that was the case, and I wouldn't be surprised if the WWE just made a power move here. Uh, but also, David Starr is someone who to his credit, I'm not a fan of the guy. I'm not going to beat around the bush and lie. To his credit, he's taking ownership of this. He's like, yeah, I- I've been very free to speak my mind, and sometimes that has consequences, and this is a consequence of, of what I say. And I-, I respect the hell out of that. I really do. And I think people need to kind of realize that you cannot like someone or not be a fan of someone and still respect a decision or, or a way they're handling something. Um, his decision not to trash WXW or go after Walter, who's the head of WXW, is a 
pretty man- magnanimous one. And the the thing that I worry about is he's been such a proponent of kind of ousting and bloodletting the industry. If there's a, a controversial topic, he's going to have an opinion on it. I feel it's disingenuous now for him not to speak the truth of what happened in his uh, departure from WXW. He says so much about so many other people. If Walter caved to pressure from the WWE, David Starr should talk about it. Not because it's our business, but because this is the, the M.O. that uh, David Starr has. If he wasn't this guy, if he was like a Chris Saban or just some random-ass dude who never talked about what happens behind the scenes, then I wouldn't be asking for this. I wouldn't be saying that you need to speak on this. But if this is a situation where a multi-billion dollar company told a fledgling promotion that you're doing business with that you need to get rid of somebody or else, that needs to be spoken about, considering all the things that you, David Starr, have said and, and, and the ideals you've preached. You cannot take a dive on this one just because you're friends with Walter, just because you're friends with Tim Thatcher. So I hope we get some information about this because mostly because I feel like if David starts going to protect his friends, then what the, why the hell should we trust anything he says about anything then? Speak what happened. Tell the truth. Or stop talking about matters that don't involve you directly. You know, I, I, I don't like this, this hemming and hawing, this hand wrangling, this picking a side and only doing it sometimes. I say how I feel when I feel it and I make no bones about it and I don't try to hide it just because it might be someone I like. And if you're going to be someone who, who's an authority or, or someone who's a, a voice in the industry with respect to your name, then be someone who's always going to tell the truth no matter who it involves and who it offends. That's it. Thanks. That's all I got. I got wings waiting for me, though, so I'm, I'm kind of happy. <laughs> Place the order on the line. Oh, yeah. I may hate Amazon. I may hate all these big, giant fucking internet goddamn everything where you can order it. And, but I'll tell you what. I love me being able to order or pre-order some food. Oh, I love me some of that. <laughs> uh, Marcus, any final thoughts on anything else tonight that you may have saw? Oh, uh, no, that's it for me. All right, Marks and I will be back on Thursday. We are reviewing a bunch of single and uh, double episodes uh, uh, issues, goddammit, of The Boys. Uh, I'm going to start reading those tonight so I don't have to cram them on Thursday. I have a feeling we're going to see some shit this, in this episode. In this yeah. episode, I mean, for, for The Boys. Uh, we're also going to talk, uh, I'll talk to Castlevania. And Marcus, uh, anything else that you might want to do for Thursday, just let me know. Because I'm sure there's gotcha. other things to talk about, but I just don't. And tomorrow, Mar- uh, Zach and I, not Marcus, Zach, and I are back to talk some impact. Thumbs up. Uh, so Marcus can be found on Twitter at Paradox Kid, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. That's me. You can also find him on his other podcast, The True Penny Show, at True Penny Show, at T-R-U-E-P-E-N-Y-S-H-O-W, on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Chad Nerdcorp, C-H-E-D-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P, and on the Instagram at Chad's Photo Hut. Be sure to check out the website, realnerdcorp.com. It's what we're brought to you by. As well as going to twitch.tv backslash wrestling underground, youtube.com backslash wrestling underground, or the Podbean at podbean.com backslash real nerd corp and download all our past shows or download the uh, mobile device, download the app to your mobile device and get the shows right there. So, there you go. so for Marcus Green, I'm Chad Porter. This has been another edition of the Wrestling Underground podcast. Marcus, take it home. Good night, me.